Good evening, buenas noches, and thank you for tuning in. On behalf of all of us at the locally based, independently owned bookstore, Books and Books in Miami, Florida, and in partnership with Miami Book Fair, it's my pleasure to welcome you to a virtual evening with Mary Roach to discuss Fuzz, When Nature Breaks the Law, an irresistible investigation into the unpredictable world where wildlife and humans meet, published by our friends at W.W. Norton and Company. Mary Roach is the author of five best-selling works of nonfiction, including Grunt, Stiff, and most recently Fuzz. Her writing has appeared in National Geographic and the New York Times Magazine, among other publications. She lives in Oakland, California, and we are huge fans here in Miami, Florida. To moderate this evening's conversation, we're joined by Sam Keen. Sam is the New York Times bestselling author of six books, including The Ice Pick Surgeon and The Dueling Neurosurgeons. His books have won multiple international awards for literary science writing, and his podcast, The Disappearing Spoon, debuted at number one on the iTunes charts for science podcasts. Throughout this evening's broadcast, you're invited to ask questions by using the Ask a Question feature at the bottom of the screen, and you can order your copy of Fuzz from Books and Books below. We truly appreciate every order and the generous donations from viewers everywhere. And now, without further ado, I'd like to welcome our guests to the virtual stage. Hello, Mary. Welcome. Hi, Christy. How are you? Good. Thank you. Hi, Sam. Hello. Hi, Sam. Hi, how are you? <laughs> Good. Well, hello, everyone. Thank you all for joining us. I am very, very excited to talk about Fuzz. It was such a fun book. It was such a perfect Mary Roach subject. And it was a blast just going from chapter to chapter. I was so eager to get from story to story. So the first question I wanted to ask you was, did the inspiration for the book come from one particular story that just kind of jumped in your head and you said, I have to find something to do with this? Or was it kind of slow building? Or was it a bunch of different ideas and it kind of coalesced? It was uh, uh, more the latter. I okay. was um, uh, just, I go through this protracted period of sort of groping and grasping for a book idea. I just, you know, try to talk to everybody. I know I poke around on the internet because I, I, you know, I don't have a list of things ready to, mm -hmm. to dive into. I wish I did. Uh, so I had been, um, I had gotten interested in wildlife crime, kind of the other, uh, the other way around when, when wildlife are the victims. I was up at a forensics lab in Ashland, Oregon, where they have the world's largest hair library <laughs> which appealed to me because it's a hair library. It's, it, or what, what is it? It, it? it yeah, well, just yes, like samples of uh, uh, un, uh, uh, guard hairs, regular hairs, whiskers, okay. uh, the underbody hairs. So it's a uh, um, an incredible resource. And this this woman also is a world expert on how to identify counterfeit tiger penis, which, as it turns out, is really easy to identify because they're always using cows and horses, which are first of all, easier to get and, uh, and also um, a little more inspirational because there's a lot bigger. The tiger has a small penis, oh, okay. so, sad <laughs> to say. Anyway, so yeah. I, I thought I'm going to, I'm heading in sort of in that direction, but then I went in to talk to the director and he said, you cannot tag along on any open case. If it's an open investigation, you can't be here. That's just forget it. So, and I need to, I kind of, for what I do, I like to be able to be on the scene reporting and Kind of just have descriptions and people and conversations. So back to the drawing board, uh, made another wrong turn into agricultural crime because I got interested. I heard about grand theft avocado, which is actually a classification yeah. of crime. Uh -huh. uh, before the Super Bowl, people steal a lot of avocados. Anyway, so I went that that dead, that was a dead end, and I was trying to do a mishmash of everything. And then finally I uh I decided to sort of turn wildlife crime around. Like what if the animals were the perpetrators and the people were the victims? Um, uh, obviously these are, you know, crimes with quotes because animals are just following instincts. They're not 
actually committing a crime. But, you know, if you think about it, they do manslaughter, they break and enter, home invasions, trespassing, mm. vandalism, littering, yeah. jaywalking. So, and like your book, uh, you know, it's organized, but, you know, Ice Pick Surgeons kind of organized by, by crime, mm -hmm. you know, by, yeah. by criminal yeah. act, uh, which I found was a, a lovely kind of way to organize it, you know, way to um, kind of present these things. Because I could have said, this is a book about human wildlife conflict, but that sounds a little dry, you know, mm -hmm. the way the professionals refer to it. So anyway, that's the long-winded <laughs> explanation of how I, how I came to the topic. I don't have a tidy origin story like that. I was okay. No, that's that. Yeah. I mean, that sometimes it's not tidy, so that's good. Uh, it's did you ever any... tidy for me? Yeah, uh, I guess so. Did you have any one story that sort of you heard it? And you said no way. That can't be true. Because for me, when you said the Vatican shooting lasers at birds, I thought no way. That's got to be <laughs> but no. It was, they were shooting lasers at birds. It was... uh, the Vatican. Yeah, the Vatican chapter was, um, I, and I heard about the. The Vatican's problem with birds um, was it, it actually there was a story from a, a few years back, not the story I reported on, uh, but the way I got into this, the the Pope once a year, come, Pope Francis comes out, well, I guess previous popes as well, comes out onto the balcony over St. Peter's and he releases a, a white dove. It's a gesture of mm -hmm. peace, something about International Children's Day or something. So, so this uh, maybe 2017, I want to say, Anyway, he releases this dove and this gesture of peace and a uh, gull comes zooming in and just grabs that sucker and you know, there's feathers flying, which I just thought was uh, incredibly ironic. And <laughs> I think the following year they released a helium balloon in the shape of a dove. Ah, so, okay. uh, but I, um, I, in reading about that, um, I, I stumbled onto the story of the, um, the floral display that mm -hmm. there's an elaborate like 6,000 daffodils and um, thousands of roses that set up every Easter the night before well the day and the night before like these big semi trucks come down and set up these flowers and anyway these gulls came in for no apparent reason apparently just vandals came in at about four in the morning and just 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 destroyed knocked over all the daffodil pots not eating anything apparently mm -hmm. just to be jerks yeah, I love that discussion when you, you were discussing with, I think, a couple of wildlife people, whether you can call gulls, uh, gulls jerks or not. Yeah, whether it was appropriate. Yeah, yeah. And they're they're like, well, it, 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 you know, they, they they do do some dickish things for sure. Yeah. She told this story of, um, she because um, they worked on this gull uh, colony up on Appledore Island, I think it is. And mm -hmm. they talked about how, because gulls get pretty territorial. And uh, they're very good at keeping you away. Like they'll dive bomb tourists if you get, you know, people get too close to a nest. But this one research student had put on a raincoat and gloves and pulled the hood all the way up like this to go because she was going to go through a passageway where there are a lot of nests and there were a mm -hmm. lot of defensive gulls. And uh, she said this gull came down and just sort of, I don't know how as a gull you do this, but just like turned its butt around and crapped in her mouth. Like the only thing that was visible on her was like, I can get you there. So um, yeah, it was an interesting uh, conversation it about- Sense weakness, yeah. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. And another thing I loved about the book was all of the, I mean, you were taking trips all over the world. We mentioned the Vatican, but also the, you were into the Himalayas, just all over the place. Did you have a favorite event or a trip that you took? Oh gosh, you know, I, I think that, um, I think the Himalaya was just a really interesting experience because, mm -hmm. first of all, it's, it's a beautiful place. It's the middle Himalaya, not the, you know, Everest and the snow-capped super peaks. This is more like closer to the foothills. And and it, first of all, it's a beautiful place. But it was so interesting because the there's a lot of uh, small villages there where they have an issue with leopards preying on people. So And there are leopards in other parts of India, but they don't do that if there's if somebody's injured by a leopard it's usually like our oh, somebody working on a tea estate the leopard was sleeping in the shade of the plant they surprised it mm -hmm. cat jumps out they maybe they get scratched or whatever the cat runs off uh so it's it but in the in this region of the middle himalaya and this has been the case for a couple hundred years there's been um uh leopards preying on people so it was, it was just fascinating 
to be because I, to, to to learn about this and just to see mm -hmm. how different it, how different the cats are there versus here where mountain lions are very you know you just never see one and a decade will go by here in California without anybody being fatally attacked it's just you know we're not on the menu yeah um, here here in the states uh, so it was very different and also the approach the approach was different with uh, animal conflict in India um, I remember that, yeah it, yeah. So, so I think that that was just fascinating because uh, it was it, and it was leopards and also elephants. The, it was a researcher from the Wildlife Institute of India who uh, goes on the road once a year to villages that have a lot of elephant conflict and leopard conflict. And the fact that there's elephant conflict, it would just blew my mind. I think of elephants right. as, you know, Babar or. Dumbo. Big, big friendly stuffed animal kind of things. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. 500 people a year are killed by elephants in, mm. in India. And uh, although it happens, and they also damage a lot of people's crops, which is very upsetting if you're a subsistence farmer. But interestingly, mm. people that, you know, if you talk to people, they don't have this anger, their desire for revenge, partly having to do with, you know, Ganesh, the elephant god. Uh, mm -hmm. People have this reverence for these animals and also for monkeys. Monkeys are another conflict animal in India, uh, and and there's a hesitation among the population to to harm them, to kill them, to trap them. It's very hard to hire a monkey catcher. The city government's mm -hmm. always got an open ad for <laughs> monkey catchers, and nobody wants the job. Right. So I think Indi India was probably my favorite, um, the f my favorite part of the the travels because yeah. it was. I mean, India is fascinating, just in yeah. general. Yeah. Do you ever do you ever plan? Okay, I want to go to some place really badly, and I'm gonna find a story there, or is it always the story kind of leading it? Oh, oh, I definitely do that. Like you I, <laughs> oh yeah, I I did. Well, I used to do that all the time as a free as a magazine freelancer. Okay. I would just be like, what story can I choose that will allow me to get to Antarctica on the National okay. Science yeah. Foundation? Like that kind of. I definitely would do that, and in this case, um, I have to say. I've never been to Vatican City, you know, the oh, Vatican okay. City State. And so the the gull, the lasers and the gulls, uh, uh, first of all, it appealed to me as just kind of, I don't know, bringing the Pope into a book about. A Pope a with a laser. Movie. Yeah. The Pope with a, the Pope with a laser. That appealed to me. But also just, uh, you know, I've never, that's somewhere I've never been. And it sounded kind of interesting. You don't, it's, it's not that easy to get into Vatican City. I can tell you. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> I did. So that that kind of appealed to me. Um, in New Zealand, I was doing a talk there anyway, actually. So I was looking around. But it, New Zealand had a, a different kind of appeal just because of they've got a really kind of radical approach to their invasive species. And mm -hmm. so that was interesting to me. So it's often it's a combination. But yeah, definitely that is a, a pull if it's if I, I find think. something. In, in a um, in a place that's kind of far flung and that I've never been, I'll definitely be working hard to to make that work. But I, you know, you just you can't force it. If there's not if there's no story right. there, there's no story. But yeah. Okay. So you you talked about the leopards. Um, you mentioned the macaques getting uh, <laughs> mugged by macaques, and then there were bears in Aspen. And the book is very fun and funny. But were there any moments during it where you were genuinely scared? Uh, there was one night where, um, in the, in the Himalaya where, um, I, I went out for a walk and I know that the leopards tend to, um, when they attack people, it's often along the road. Uh, I started out when it was daylight. Uh, mm -hmm. I walked, I, I kind of got a little turned around. And so I ended up being out later than I thought it was getting to be dusk. Yeah. And so I'm walking back along this road and I know this road well, because when we drove in, um, we drove, you know, we drove up from where we'd been with the elephants and all along that road, the researcher, Dipanjan Naha, it was like this, you know, on, it was like the leopard death tour. You know, he'd be like that bus shelter there uh, two years ago, an old man is sitting alone. A leopard takes him this field here, an audacious attack in broad daylight. Six people working. A young woman was taken over here and old. So I was like. Oh my God, it's dusk, the time when they attack. I'm out on the road. What an idiot. <laughs> By myself. So you didn't have this thought before you started the walk? It was well, I thought it was day, you know, it's daylight. And I thought, yeah. okay, you know, and I wasn't gonna go far and I just didn't time it well. Uh, uh so okay. and I didn't really, I don't know, I just kind of wasn't thinking about it. It's just when you know when the sun starts to go down, 
and, it, and there's no one on the road. You know, it's a pretty, mm -hmm. it's not a well populated area. So right. it just, be, it became a little creepy. So okay. I, I mean, yeah, so there's a, there's a little, uh, but, uh, but I didn't, I didn't feel, um, I, I actually wanted to, you know, I got close to a leopard. We, cause there had a, a radio caller and we had the receiver. And so mm -hmm. we knew we were about a hundred yards from a leopard. I would have just loved to see one. So I, I yeah, wasn't so yeah. much nervous as disappointed that I didn't, you know, we didn't get to the leopard. It was across a river. Yeah. Uh, I, that actually was my next question. Uh, were there any big disappointments where you got close and didn't see it? Was the leopard the big one? Um, the leopard, that was a disappointment that I didn't see a leopard. Yeah, and, and I, you know, it's, it's as with mountain lions, it's so unlikely that you are going to see one. They're very stealthy. They're very, until they, you know, jump out and pounce on their prey. You just, you just don't, you, well, I, the, the odds of seeing one in the short span of time that I, I mean, I was there for a week. So it was pretty unlikely. Um, I I really wanted to see an elephant, and I really wanted to go out with the elephant response team. And th these are people who, in a vehicle, uh, will go when when you know, when when a, when a, somebody spots elephants in the area, they'll text the the elephant response team, who uh, come in in the vehicle, and they kind of herd the the group uh, off. To the you know back to the forest area uh, they try to keep them together because when you split apart um, a group of elephants they become very agitated and and anxious and unhappy and defensive and that's when people get trampled uh -huh. so um i really wanted so i was di i really bugged these <laughs> this poor guy a lot like no really can i go could i go tomorrow night he's like it's very dangerous you can't go so um I, I really had wanted to do that. So yes, that, that was a disappointment. Okay. But, yeah. um, it's tough with animals, you know, you, you, right, try right. To, you can't set it up. It's either going to happen or not. I got lucky right. with the bears Aspen. and the Aspen back alley. And uh, you know, of course the gulls are, were easy enough, but um, <laughs> yeah, the, the elephants were, that, that was a, uh, uh, that would have been great. Okay. So sort of the flip side of that, was there anything that you just sort of stumbled into where you were like, Oh my God, I can't believe that that worked out. Well, the, the, go ahead. Well, you, the you monkey know. sanctuary, I don't remember the name of it. But that's yeah, it. Yeah. yeah. That was right. The, 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 uh, the place where all the, you know, when they, when the new Delhi government manages to have monkey catchers on staff, uh, <laughs> when they catch the monkeys, they take them down to this place in the South of Delhi of New Delhi and the, the it, it's an old plaster of Paris mine. And I had this image of, you know, kind of um, yeah. dusty kind of barren grounds. And uh, in fact, it's really a beautiful place, but you, you can't mm. really, you, you will not be allowed in there if you ask, but I just, I, I knew a journalist there and she was, had been helping me uh, uh, with various things like translation and things interpretation and so she, uh, she came with me and we just uh, lucked out there was a guy in the parking lot who's who she said oh we're trying to get down to the you know the monkey area and he said oh i'm going there now i'll show you you know and he, so you know he got in the car and and he was you know he was great because he happened to be the guy who took care of the monkeys he had mm -hmm. spent many years uh, with the monkeys so he was a great source and he you know showed us how to get there it was like a you know three miles out into the boonies which I, I would never, if I tried to appeal to the authorities or the, you know, South Delhi Municipal Corporation, it yeah. would have gone, I can tell you it would have gone nowhere. So yeah. that was lucky. You know, so, yeah, that yeah. was great. It was in there. Yeah. I admired yeah. that. I would say. Yeah. <laughs> it's just, just show up. I've done, yeah. I, I, I find sometimes that like when I was working on packing for Mars, uh, NASA, they, they were cooperative for some things, okay. but there was a, a, I want, there was a cadaver study. And because of stiff, I thought, well, you know, the stiff fans, I got to throw a cadaver in if I can. And it was an interesting project, too. It was had to do with, you know, splashdown test and with the astronauts, you know, if the capsule landed sideways with the hardware of the suit break an arm or something. Mm -hmm. And they just they they kept saying no. And then the Ohio State researcher goes, he goes, just show up, <laughs> just show up. So I showed up and the NASA people are uh, they're like, oh, nice to meet you. Who are you? I said, oh, I'm Mary Roach. And they're like, what? <laughs> like run down, tell the graduate students who are wiring up the cadaver, don't speak to her. They ran in and called public affairs. Oh boy. Okay. 
Uh, the woman from public affairs goes, Mary Roach is there. Oh, just talk to her. So, um, oh, okay. I figured it might've been the other way around, but that's, that's good. Well, I think she just gave up. Like just, I think oh, maybe okay. she, she, I think she, cause she had said no over and over and over. Uh, but I think it was just, she might've had the sense that since I'm there, you know, it's probably going to be in the book either way. Mm -hmm. so, okay. uh, so, that, so that's uh, it. Just show up and then just wear them down, huh? Just okay. wear them down. And if, uh, if, if that doesn't work, just show up. Okay. <laughs> I don't know. That's kind of what I've had to do sometimes. Yeah. But, um, uh, yeah. So yeah, that was, that was fortuitous. The guy, okay. the monkey guy. Yeah. And, the, so and our, the, the, the bears too. The, I mean, I had one night in Aspen. Oh, I didn't realize that. I guess. Okay. One night. I was, I was there because I corralled the researcher into driving down. He doesn't live in Aspen. He's um, up in, um, he's in Fort Collins. And so uh, he drove to meet me. And he, so he was, we just had a day and an evening. So I said, would you, can we set our alarms for three in the morning and go see if there's any bears raiding the dumpsters behind the restaurants? And he, he was generous enough to set his alarm for three in the morning. Okay. And I thought, you know, what are the odds? that we're going to run into a bear. But, you know, the second we got there down that alley, there were two bears right there. So pretty good odds. Okay. Yeah. I yeah. mean, so much happened in that chapter. I guess I didn't realize it was just one, one day and one night. So, okay. It was one day and one night, which is so, so often, you know, that like, uh, well, I guess it's uh, sometimes it's sometimes I'm, I'm somewhere for a couple of weeks, but often it's just a day and a day and a night that I'm, cause I see people don't only want, you know, you can only be a pest for so long. You know? Right. Yeah. <laughs> Okay. Um, so are you an animal person yourself? You have a, a lot of pets or? I don't, we don't have any pets actually. I used to have cats and my husband is a dog person. So we kind of cancel each other out. Like, uh, okay. um, I've gone a lot. So a dog would be a little, right. I, mean, I guess, you know, he, for me. Yeah. I, I don't know. Do you have yeah. pets? I do not. It's same, same thing. I'm gone a lot. So yeah. Yeah. I do like animals. I, you know, I have a wildlife camera that I, put out in the backyard. We have possums, skunks, raccoons, a roof rat, uh, mm -hmm. at any, you know, uh, on any given evening, there's a lot of socializing back there in the backyard. So, um, and I'm, um, you know, I'm a big believer in coexistence and, uh, just, you know, mm -hmm. keeping them out of your house rather than having to deal with animals once they get in. So, yeah. Um, did, yeah. did writing the book change the way you look at animals or maybe the way you look at people as well? Um, writing. Yeah, actually um, not so much the big ones, you know, the, the bears, I've always loved the bears, mm -hmm. bears and cougars. Um, but the, uh, the little ones that, you know, rodents and birds and the ones that get, we uh, tend, we, we refer to as pests, pests. I think that when we use that word, it, um, it puts them in the context of our lives entirely. And mm -hmm. it gives us permission in a certain way to just, just, you know, call someone to deal with it, call the exterminator, you know, call the person who's going to trap them and do who knows what with them. Um, it just makes it a little too easy for us. And I kind of felt bad for them because the history of, uh, well, the history of what we've done to animals in general, because of, um, you know, uh, partly because of at the behest of farmers, but also ranchers, hunters. I mean, there's been a lot of uh, lo a lot of killings over the you know over the centuries. Uh, we've got we've gotten better, but the uh, there's still you know this the numbers of animals uh, killed because they're in conflict with um, business. You know, agriculture. Um, it's it's and there's and, and and just and killing them isn't a good. It's not effective. It, you know, it's right, yeah. uh, much better. To, field, yeah. yeah, yeah, it's 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 much more effective to, uh, you know, remove what's attractive to them. The you know food source. I mean, there we have the rat infestations. Um, you know, when the when the plague was here in the in San Francisco, part of that was the the the, the building codes were that they were not they were not uh, taking into account. You know, keep, keeping this keeping the foundation sealed. I mean, the part of the, part of the problem was that these the animals could have free access to mm -hmm. any building. So they were in and out and the building codes now are designed to exclude rodents. I mean, that is why we don't have, so, so unless you have like an old brick warehouse or something, uh, mm -hmm. you're, you're going to have uh, uh, rodents getting at the food, you know, if it's a restaurant or whatever, um, they're, uh, 
there's just better ways to do it. Yeah. Anyway, I'm not sure where I was going with that, but <laughs> no, it's good. It, the, the insight's always good. Um, and I guess kind of building off that a little bit, uh, toward the end of the book, you said at one point, it's hard to feel peaceful about the killing of some species in order to preserve others. Did this book leave you feeling uncomfortable at the end, or did you get a sense of sort of peace or resolve or anything? Around, well, that, yeah, that issue had, you know, that was uh, New Zealand, um, mm -hmm. where there's a program pro called Predator Free 2050, which is an attempt to eliminate the three main um, invasive species that are killing the flightless birds and a lot of reptile species as well in New Zealand. So it's an effort to rid these rather sizable islands of all the uh, invasive uh, possums, rats, and stoats. And it was interesting because when I first got there, I was at this beach where there's these amazing penguins, yellow-eyed penguins, uh, which are down to a few thousand birds. Uh, and that, you know, they probably aren't going to make it more than 10 years if things keep mm -hmm. going. And part of that is the stoats eating the eggs and the chicks. And so when I was there, I was like, yes, let's do everything we can to save these beautiful bizarre looking creatures that like how sad to have them leave the planet. And then I went and spent some time with this guy, Bruce Warburton, who is trying to come up with more humane traps and poisons for the stoats, pots and possums and rats. Because, you know, if, if we, if they, as a culture, if they're going to do this, if they're going, they've made this decision to exterminate these three species from the island, then for God's sakes, do it humanely. And right. so I'm spending time and, and, you know, they're testing a, a more humane poison. Okay. It's still not, still not a fun thing for a possum. So I'm looking at these, and these poor possums and it's like, you know, how is that fair? <laughs> you know, especially since the possums were brought in to establish mm -hmm. a fur trade, you know, yeah. it was, it was we who brought them in and now it's we humans. And then now we're exterminating them. But on the other hand, I understand why the people of New Zealand would want to hold on to their amazing biodiversity of, of the island and that is disappearing. And so, mm -hmm. do, you know, do you, do you want to be an island with only three species? I, I, mm -hmm. I get, I understand both sides and I don't, I, I and also understand why there's a lot of disagreement. Yeah. It's a, it's a tough issue. Yeah. And uh, the, the gene drive chapter was interesting when I think you mentioned in the introduction, I thought she's going to go into gene drives. I didn't see how it was going to fit in, but it fit in very nicely actually. Yeah, gene drives are, yeah, an interesting, you know, I mean, to the, the gene drive that I talk about in the book, uh, it was a genetic modification that would, um, well, they're the first animal, that, the animal that they're sort of working out on is is mice. So, yeah, it would be, uh, the mice could, uh, would only be able to give birth to, to male offspring. So, mm -hmm. pretty quickly, that's going to, you know, uh, there's not going to be any more births. So there's not going to be any more births. That's the dead end right there. So, uh, and then the gene drive is something that uh, it's a mechanism to have that appear in all the offsprings rather than half the offspring. So mm -hmm. it speeds it up. It speeds up the process. What you have to do initially though, is kind of flood the area with those gene drive specimens. So right. you're going to actually make the problem worse briefly. Um, and then, it, you know, and then you would kind of eliminate them in that area. But what made me uncomfortable is that, um, you know, where, who decides what's a pest? Who decides um, mm -hmm. what, what animal would we do this with? And, um, you know, if you look at the USDA or the public health lists of pests, they're, you know, the beavers and cormorants. And I mean, it's a, it's a long list of animals, you know, bears and bobcats. Uh, a lot of animals uh, cause problems with mm -hmm. uh, with uh, ranching and live you know livestock killing agriculture. So um, to, to sort of cede control to the USDA, who is doing the work, National Wildlife Research Center, um, that, I, I, that's a little tricky. So yeah. it's you know, and, and any time I don't know, it's the, as R Donald Rumsfeld put it, the unknown unknowns. Mm -hmm. seems to be um, anytime you kind of step in and, and mess with the scheme of things, uh, so th things happen that you aren't anticipating. But anyway, it, it does seem to, you know, if you can, if you could harness it and use it properly, it is a much more face. humane. Yeah. On the face of it, it's a, mm -hmm. it's a more humane way to deal with it than a, you know, raining down 1080 poison over, over the entire forest or right. setting out, um, setting. I mean, you know, traps. If the trap is is 
well constructed. It could be a very quick, humane death. Um, so, but but you can't trap them all. You know, you can't, right. especially. Yeah, exactly. you know, I mean, these, these are huge tracts of of wilderness, and you'd have to you know to get every single one. Uh, would be tough. And if you don't get them all, they're just going to come back. So, anyway, I, it's a it's interesting what they're trying to do there. Yeah. yeah. Um, so we're probably going to do a couple more questions here and then we'll open it up to the audience. So be sure to yeah. chime in with your questions there. Um, so one question I had, I, I, I like how you, um, I mean, the humor obviously is great, but I, I always wonder about the little observations. Do you know often at the time when you're seeing something like, oh yeah, that's going in the book and, or is it more you just look back at it later and you want to put something in there. There was one joke, especially it was the elevator button. Do not press, do not press repeatedly that the second time it came in, it was just such a nice joke. It was very well done. I just wondered about, are you, are you putting that in like knowing it's going to be good or is it just something, you know, the fourth or fifth time through you kind of go back and piece it together. Like um, it's both the, the, the oh, elevator, okay. the sign do not cause the, the elevator in this massive bureaucratic building, um, mm -hmm. it takes like 10 minutes to come. And obviously people have gotten really pissed off and broken the button. So there's this, this sign, do not press repeat. And I just wrote it down in my notebook because everything about that big bureaucratic place just kind of cracked me up. But, mm -hmm. um, and then as I'm writing up the scene in which this veterinary bureaucrat refuses to answer my questions, tries to pawn me off on the forest department guy who says mm -hmm. it's not, my concern because these animals are no longer wild that they are so that you know it was I, I kept asking him questions and he kept not answering and and it, that's when it occurred to me because i was obviously pressing him repeatedly okay for information. Yeah. so it only uh, only as i was writing it did i realize oh i can pull that in again which is okay. an exciting yeah. moment when you realize that but I uh, often it's a, a detail that i see and i'm you know i'll write it down and circle it mm -hmm. cuz i know it's going to be a a fun detail to put in. Okay. Um, so it's a combination. Okay. I don't know about you, but I always end up when reporting trips, just note pages full of stuff. That yes. Like, so, and oh, then, yeah. Yeah. I know. I would say I end up using 1% of everything I write down. 1%. Okay. I don't know. It's so, it's so little of it ends up. Yeah. Okay. Maybe it's 5%. What would you say? 5% sounds a little more. Uh, okay. Yeah. Maybe 5%. Five but. but, you know, I'll have, you know, a reporter's notebook. You know, from the one on, on the reporting trip in India, you know, filled the entire thing and then turned it over and filled all the back of it. Pages, yeah. And um, and then I, I go through and I pull out what I'm going to use and I type it up and, and that ends up like 15 or 20 pages. And of that, I use maybe 10 okay. percent. So, yeah. yeah, I know it's a tiny amount. I just write everything mm -hmm. down. I'm just right because you don't know. I don't know where I'm really going with exactly. a chapter, yeah. you know, when I'm there. Um, I, th I think when I arrive, I have a, a sense of what this chapter is, but I really have no idea. So mm -hmm. I'm just taking it all down. And okay. people often remark on that, like, do you ever stop writing? I'm like, nope. <laughs> what did you just <laughs> say, dude? I don't know. You ever stop writing? I just always, uh, well, I just want, because I'm not going to be able to go back. Yeah. I mean, it pays off. It's rich in detail. So it, it pays off. Yeah. I mean, the details are the fun stuff, really. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, well, one quick question for now, and I think we'll, then we'll jump into the audience questions. Uh, and I don't want to spoil anything, but I just, I do have to ask, yeah. is the roof rat still there? You know, I haven't been putting the wildlife, my wildlife camera no. broke okay. down and that's oh, no. when I would see him or her. Um, mm -hmm. yeah, I, I need to get a new one, it, uh, but pr pretty much every night that little guy was, would, you know, the, the raccoon was most nights, the possum and skunk were inter, you know, kind of interchangeable once or twice a week, but that little guy, I would see him every night running across the deck uh, down in the yard. So I don't know. I have, I haven't checked in lately. Okay. All right. You didn't yeah. name it you know, anything? No, I didn't name I should have named it. I should have <laughs> named it. Yeah. Right. Okay. Well, let's yeah. hop into some audience questions here. Um, let's see here. So kind of a, a uh, common question. People want to know how long did you work on the book? Oh yeah. Yeah. Uh, um, two, I would say between two and three years. Um, two and three years. Okay. Uh, the, um, uh, if, is if that long I, for you? Is that short for you? That is, that is actually a little long. Yeah. Long long, that's okay. long for me. Um, 
I, I was kind of slow getting into it. And then uh, uh, the places that I wanted to go, they were kind of spread out. Um, I, you know, if I could plan, if I could set the schedule, if I could, you know, mm -hmm. say exactly when I was going to go, um, I might be able to do it sooner, but it, it just, I'm, I'm kind of slow. I'm, I mean, how long do you take on a book? Usually, yeah, that sounds about right. Usually one and a half to two years of the actual yeah. writing and, uh, yeah, the reporting yeah. and everything. Um, yeah. but it just, yeah, it just depends. Uh, I mean, yeah, as you said, if you could redo it and sort of get the whole schedule out perfectly the f i mean it, yeah. would, it would take a lot less time but you're just like oh i have to go back there and stuff and it just yeah exactly and that's life yeah. and everything works out and so. i um i write chapters up as i get enough material i don't wait till i've reported everything and then write okay. yeah uh do you do that yeah because i think in both our cases the chapters are a bit more they, they can stand on yeah level. Yeah, it's like a series of short stories around. Yeah, the yeah, exactly. You know? Which, so, yeah, yeah, I, I always, I hear. I remember Susan Orlean saying, uh, she she had like seven years of reporting for one book before she started writing, like boxes and boxes of material. I'm like I, I horrifying. I couldn't do that. Horrifying. Yeah. Totally. Yeah, not for me either. <laughs> uh, we have a question from Marcus Luke Slux. What do you think of the USDA efforts using quote scare tactics to exclude birds from airports? Uh, well, I had I got a whole uh, chapter on scaring birds. Um, mm -hmm. I didn't specifically report on airports. Um, the I get you know the the uh, I reported on using lasers with the at the Vatican, um, but that's you know uh, the, one of the things you have to be careful with is is to make sure, especially in an airport, uh, you got to make sure that the the laser isn't going to hit the pilots. Mm, yeah. Uh, in the eye. Um, so I, I don't know if lasers are, are used. I mean, I think the thing with, the thing with birds, uh, you know, if, and I don't know how they're particularly, do, you know, at what he's referring to, which airport and how they're scaring them. A lot of times propane cannons, loud noises are used, which okay. works for a little while and then they come back. Uh, so it, they get habituated to it. Um, another thing you can do is, you know, manipulate the landscape. It's, it's tough though. Airports tend to be on the fringes of the city and it's often in wetlands. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of a lot of birds, um, obviously in the in wetlands. So that makes it that makes it tricky. But I I'm, I don't know specifically what Wildlife Services is doing on it, which particular airports. Uh, so, but anyway, okay. there is a bird scaring. Yeah, chapter. what you said there actually brought up a question I I wanted to ask, but I forgot. Um, so habituation is obviously a problem. You know, you can't just keep shooting the cannons. Were there any animals that were either so skittish or maybe so dumb that they never got habituated? Where they just <laughs> could not learn and <laughs> keeps working um well th when you use scary things whether it's noise or um or there's some things like fladry they call it or fladry or just okay. tying a colored ribbon to a barbed wire fence will freak out um wolves oh, and yeah, coyotes yeah. but but you have you have to use it intermittently and and sparingly like use okay. it during calving season with the times when you're really having problems because if you just do it all the time, they'll be like, Oh, it's that ribbon. But when mm -hmm. it it's used intermittently, also they, they've got a, um, they use in, in India, they call them Fox lights and they're lights that come on. They're supposed to look like a person walking with a flashlight mm -hmm. and they, it, 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 it happens, you know, intermittently and it's, you can't just leave it on, but when it works, the people want to leave it on all the time. Well, they're like, it works. We want right. to leave it on all the time. Well then, the animal just yeah, it ignores it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I was reading some story. Yeah. Yeah. I was reading some story oh. recently. They were trying to scare bears off and they were using what they called turbo folk music. It was in from Serbia <laughs> or something. That seemed to work well, but until the generator ran out and then the bear. Turbo ran oh my God. There was turbo one folk, yeah. somebody was using in Japan. This is after my book was done. Um, mm -hmm. this robotic monster wolf thing with glowing eyes. I mean, it was a tremendous amount of work that went into, wow. and I'm sure it worked for a month. Yeah. I uh, actually, I, I, I wrote a story several years ago about the Smithsonian and they were rehabilitating some, I think it was black footed lemurs. I think they're the endangered ones and they would grow them in captivity and then they would send them out in the wild and they would get massacred because they'd never seen a predator before. So they invented a robo badger that would kind of come in like this to scare them and just teach them to stay away from these things. So oh, wow. I'm surprised there are more people using robots, I guess. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a really interesting approach. Yeah. yeah. Wow. 
Yeah, the um, somebody did a study where they looked at, um, you know, because you know, people do that thing where they put the owl, you know, the, to scare right, away. Yeah. You know, they'll have a carving of an owl and or a plastic. I don't know if it's plastic, but they did one where they're like, okay, let's make it as realistic as possible. So they had taxidermied specimens of these hawks mm -hmm. to see if they would, you know, how long it would deter the prey species. And the answer was five to eight hours. Hours. Okay. <laughs> nice. Birds are like. That's obviously not going anywhere. Okay. That uh, that so we, all right. We have one more reader question here or viewer question here. So if anyone has anything more, get them in now. But Gray asks, did you have any encounters with the wildlife you were researching that were closer than you'd like? I think you talked about this a little bit, but the bears in Aspen, that was the one for me, especially where I was like, gee, is quite close to these bears. I, I, yeah. Yeah. We were very close. I mean, there were, we went into the alley. And, the, and there was, you know, there was these big bags of garbage torn open. The bears had run off when they heard Stuart's truck, but we mm -hmm. pulled about 10 feet away, 15 feet away and just sat in the truck. And they, within minutes, uh, one of them came back and then the second, and we got out. So we were, yeah, we were, st and, and initially I was, because it's a bear, you know, it was a little bit, I, it was such a, um, t just such strongly competing emotions of, Mm -hmm. nervousness and wanting to get a little closer because yeah. they're so amazing. And I don't, you know, I don't encounter bears that often. So yeah. um, good for the book too. And you were right. It was, yeah, it was good for the book. So um, yeah, I think that, and I was also a little nervous with the, uh, the, the, the macaques, you know, cause I'm on a trail. Uh, okay. There's nobody's kind of no one around. And I was kind of asking for it. I had a bag, a little market bag for, with bananas in it mm -hmm. so um i had you know i knew i knew that i was uh setting myself up as a victim but then when that you know that guy sort of comes up to me and i've heard all the stories about they'll, they'll like slap you they'll turn your pockets inside out they'll people there's something like 850 monkey bites a year in new delhi mm -hmm. so i was like um i don't know if this was the smartest thing but then you know the the one i was facing uh we're just looking at each other and then one came from the side and actually grabbed the bag Oh, right. They're uh, working together. Yeah. It kind of appeared they were pretty slick. Yeah. They're, uh, they're smart. Um, yeah. Yeah. Do do monkeys actually like bananas? Is that I figured that was kind of a cartoon <laughs> thing, like rice and peas, where, but they do. They that's do. The, they, yeah. But uh, I also saw a monkey eating a bag of tomatoes. I saw a monkey eating, you know, like a it, monkeys eat. No, like rice. They, they like, to, yeah, they like raccoons. They'll eat, they like corn. They like cucumbers. They like, candy uh they're 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 like right they're pretty unchoosy yeah okay. but they do love it but these they, they, they relish they seem to relish those bananas of mine they were interesting mine. okay great yeah yeah well so, um on that note i think that was all of, well one you do handle one more question here someone just popped in um can you discuss how people in the 19th century and earlier dealt with quote criminal animals yeah the, um there's an amazing book that was came out in 1906 called the Cap the criminal prosecution and capital punishment of animals. And it is utterly fascinating. It's about 1500s to, I'd say the 1700s. And the, the example I used in the book was this, uh, these caterpillars that were coming in and eating crops as caterpillars will do. They eat leaves and, you know, when they're, when, when it's caterpillar time, there's a lot of damaged crops. So the, the town put these, uh, posted a summit, these summonses on trees near the land and the caterpillars were told to appear in court where they would be assigned legal representation. Um, and uh, the day came, the caterpillars did not show up, but the, uh, the, the, the legal entities went ahead and had some proceedings and they decided, well, we will uh, set aside a different plot of land for the caterpillars. So they will have food and our people will have food. So just kind of like showing off their wisdom. It was kind of a, an all show kind of, we have dominion even over nature and we will make everything right. So that seemed to be what they were doing. But there were cases, I mean, in the book has this, you know, the appendix has all these original documents, including a, a bill for expenses that a bailiff submitted for keeping a pig in the expenses of feeding the pig while it was in prison awaiting trial. So they would uh, have trials, which is bizarre because, I mean, now uh, livestock and pets are, they're considered property and the owner would be the person you would be dealing with and putting, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, fining or putting on trial. 
uh, but it used to be the animals themselves. And it's a really interesting book. It's a little dense to read, but um, but uh, a, a fa a interesting, although not very effective approach to human yeah. animal conflict. Yeah, yeah, yeah. actually tr uh, trials and hangings and um, I've heard ex that, yeah. excommunication. There's a you know, bears being excommunicated from the church like they care. <laughs> Okay. Yeah. Well, I think we will wrap up on that note, unless there was anything you wanted to add or circle back to. Anything like no, that? I think uh, Christy's coming back in at yep. so some point. Everyone yeah. go order a copy right now. Get on there. Get a book. And if you don't get mine, get one of Sam's. It's just Peering Spoon or uh, Ice Pick Surgeon is amazing. We uh, I read that one when, when it came out, and it's really good. There actually is one more question. Sorry. Um, oh, okay. Pat, she says, I apologize if you address this, but with human changes during the pandemic, what impact did this have on animals? That's an interesting question. Well, there were, uh, there were, yeah, I mean, I had finished the book uh, pretty much by the time COVID hit, we ended up delaying publication. Um, so I was, I, I was done at that point reporting so i so i didn't um i didn't f formally report on anything but i just remember various news stories from all over about when people stayed in uh, the animals were more encouraged to to spend more time in in urban areas you were just people were seeing a lot more <clears throat> wildlife in places that they hadn't seen them before mm -hmm. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. okay well this has been Fantastic. Thank you so much. What a great conversation. Um, I just want to thank our viewers as well for watching. Remind you that if you want a copy of Fuzz, all you have to do is hit that green button at the bottom of the screen. And if you're in Miami and you want to come by one of our stores, we have it in all of them. So please do that. And I hope that we're going to see you in person, Mary and Sam, at some point. In I Miami. hope so, too. Yeah. And I thank you so much for supporting Books and Books and supporting indie bookstores in general. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Good everyone. Night. Thank you, Christy.